Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Muy buenos días a todos. Tar eh, buenas tardes o buenas noches, dependiendo de donde te estén conectando. Um, this will be a dual language event in English and Spanish. Please use the translation button in the bottom uh, left of your screen to select the language you are most comfortable with. We recommend keeping the original audio on low volume. Eh, este evento va a ser transmitido en inglés y en español. Eh, por favor, utilicen el botón de traducción en la parte eh, baja izquierda de su pantalla, seleccionando el lenguaje que quieran utilizar y les recomendamos que por favor mantengan el audio original en volumen bajo. Les voy a dar un segundo, even guys a second to get that completed. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar on Farming Under the Rainbow, LGBTQI plus inclusive development and agricultural programs in Honduras and Central America. I am Alejandro Valencia. My pronouns are he, his, and him. And I am the Senior Knowledge Management uh, Advisor at USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Before we begin, uh, let me orient you to the Blue Jeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you will see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world who are connected. To ask a question, please use the button labeled Q&A on the bottom right. Please also indi indicate who your question is for. Feel free to vote on uh, previous questions you want answered. You can ask questions through the webinar, um, throughout the webinar at any point, and we'll be collecting them. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. So stay on uh, to hear the, the, the answers. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of that window to adjust the view. Um, lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email the post-event resources as soon as they are available. Uh, you can also find the resources at agrilinks.org whenever they are ready. Um, thank you for your attention. I will now uh, present uh, Jay uh, Gilliam, uh, who is the senior uh, LGBTQI plus coordinator, coordinator at USAID. Uh, his pronouns are he, him, and his. In his role, he works to uh, meaningfully integrate lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and other people of diverse genders and sexualities into USAID's inclusive development programs, policies, research, and training. He has served as the director of the global program at the Human Rights Campaign. He also served during the Obama administration at USAID, where he worked on program policy, uh, public engagement, and communications, particularly on the agency's LGBTQI plus and food security work. Jay also worked at uh, the Aga Khan Foundation USA in Washington, D.C., and uh, Peace Boat Japan in Tokyo. Uh, just a quick reminder for everyone, use that translation button um, and ask us questions. If you can't figure it out, we'll be happy to help. With that, I will ask Jay to unmute. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the event. Muchas gracias, Alejo, and hola a todos. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to Farming Under the Rainbow, LGBTQI plus inclusive development and agricultural programs in Honduras and Central America. Again, my name is Jay Gilliam. I use pronouns he, him, his, and I am the uh, USAID Senior LGBTQI plus coordinator. And we're so glad to see so many of, of you joining us from wherever you are um, from all around the world. You know, today's event was organized in collaboration with the USAID Center for Agriculture in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Um, and it really is a culmination of the LGBTQI plus theme month on AgriLinks. And so we are so pleased that this is our first time discussing lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex people, and all people really of diverse sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics or as we like to say, Sogi-esque, and all of this being done on AgriLinks for the first time. 
Um, but you know, this is not the first time that USAID has explored the important connections of people with diverse SOGIES and agriculture and food security programs. Last year, USAID's Inclusive Development Hub and the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security was pleased to release the sectoral guidance document integrating LGBTQI plus considerations into resilience and food security programming sectors. The guidance really identified some of the challenges and obstacles that LGBTQI plus individuals may face with regard to accessing food, water security and sanitation, and resources for meaningful participation in agriculture. The sector guidance also highlights approaches and best practices from USAID missions and around the world. And so I encourage you to read and share the document as well as provide us with feedback and more examples that we can highlight. There are also additional AgriLinks LGBT Tribe Plus theme month guest blogs available on AgriLinks website. And all of that is filled with additional content analysis and recommendations on this topic. So my colleagues will share a link to those in the chat box. But let's get to the heart of today's discussion. I'm really pleased to be joined by an outstanding panel of experts and LGBTQI plus inclusive development trailblazers to share what they've learned and how they are approaching LGBTQI plus inclusion in the agriculture sector. After the panel, we will move to a Q&A portion with you all, and I'll wrap up the event with some brief reflections on the discussion. So I hope that everyone will join the conversation by putting your questions for the panelists and myself into the Q&A function, and you can put your questions in English or Spanish, and we will do our best to respond. Uh, of course, please remember to be respectful to one, anum, one another and our speakers. And we also encourage you to amplify this conversation on Twitter and tag us using at USAID underscore LGBTQI. So before we move to the panel discussion, let me just share some additional context about what inspired today's conversation. You know, for USAID, LGBTQI plus persons access to nutritious food and decent work are part and parcel of inclusive development. For us, inclusive development is an understanding that every individual and community of all diverse identities and experiences are instrumental in the transformation of their own societies. Their engagement throughout the development process just leads to better outcomes. And this includes sustainable livelihoods for all LGBTQI plus people so that they can thrive and reach their fullest potential. And we know we will only achieve the sustainable development goals, including SDG 2 on zero hunger, if we ensure no one is left behind. And discrimination, intimidation, harassment, stigmatization, and exclusion impact the livelihoods and dignity of LGBTQI plus persons all around the world. This will be talked about in much more detail by our panelists today. You know, the discussion on food security cannot move forward without recognizing the horrific impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on LGBTQI plus people. A study conducted by Outright Action International in 2020 showed that LGBTQI plus people disproportionately faced food insecurity due to their overrepresentation in informal economies that were halted or disrupted due to lockdown. And when employers discriminate against people based on their SOGIESque, our communities find ways to make ends meet, but this is often in more precarious employment and in informal economies that are sensitive to shocks like COVID-19. You know, LGBTQI plus people may also face discrimination at home being left out of family inheritance to land, capital, or other resources. While LGBTQI people are resilient and find ways to make ends meet through chosen family and networks, we in the development community have a particular responsibility to ensure that LGBTQI plus people have equitable opportunities to thrive. I'm proud to share here that USAID just launched a new five-year public-private partnership to bolster the economic livelihoods of LGBTQI plus people during and after the COVID-19 pandemic through direct grant making and capacity building to LGBTQI plus community-based organizations, networking and participation in regional and global development forums for activists and strengthening the engagement of allies and champions for LGBTQI plus social inclusion. 
we're really excited to launch this new public-private partnership. We also intend to support USAID missions around the world to pilot LGBTQI plus economic livelihood programs that directly address barriers to food security facing LGBTQI plus people across all sectors where we work. Our goal is to broaden partnerships between the development community and LGBTQI plus organizations. Lastly, I've worked with my team in the Inclusive Development Hub and across USAID to build new training modules on LGBTQI plus inclusive development for staff at headquarters and in missions around the world. So please continue to follow us on our Twitter page for more information and opportunities to engage with us. You know, I'm a strong believer that through partnership with LGBTQI plus civil society, the experts on their realities, we have the tools technical expertise, and sense of urgency to secure a safe, sustainable future for all LGBTQI plus people. So this brings me to our panel today. You know, our objectives are to one, spotlight global best practices, studies, and recommendations for integrating LGBTQI plus considerations in agricultural development programs. And to two, highlight a promising program from USAID Honduras that recently began its partnership with an LGBTQI plus led organization for agriculture sector focused skills development. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panelists today. We have Dr. Jen Williamson, who is the Vice President for Gender and Social Inclusion at ACDI VOCA. Jen also serves as the Gender and Agricultural Systems Advisor at the Deputy Chief of Party level for the Advancing Women's Empowerment Program, which is funded by USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. We also have Katia Rivera, who is the Gender and Social Inclusion Specialist for the Transforming Market Systems Activity, which is implemented by ACDI VOCA and funded by USAID Honduras. Katia has experienced training female entrepreneurs in the improvement of their businesses through a gender perspective and leading female empowerment workshops in indigenous communities in the Honduran Dry Corridor. We also have Elvin Ponce, who is the Director of Economic Empowerment Programs and one of the founding members of the Center for LGBTI Development and Cooperation, or SOMOS CDC. Elvin has been an LGBTI human rights defender for 15 years and currently manages the Savings and Credit Cooperative for LGBTI development, which promotes the continuous improvement of LGBTI organizations through empowerment and institutional strengthening. And finally, we have Angeles Maradilla, who is a technical team volunteer at SOMO CDC and an intern in the management and social development faculty of the Metropolitan University of Honduras. Angeles has worked in the LGBTI movement for eight years. So, as a reminder, please add your questions to the panel in the Q&A box so we can keep this event interactive. And I also encourage the panelists to ask follow-up questions to our other speakers or offer your reflection on their experience. So first, I want to begin with a question for Jen. Jen, you have been following and writing about issues pertaining to people with diverse SOGIES in the development and agricultural sectors for quite some time. Can you provide a bit of context on why it is important for development practitioners to take LGBTQI plus persons into account in agricultural and food security programming? And why has this been a priority for ACDI VOCA given that many tend to immediately think of more civil and political rights with regard to LGBTQI plus programs? And then lastly, why is this issue of LGBTQI plus livelihoods and economic empowerment equally important to consider? So Jen, over to you. Thank you for that question or that series of questions, Jay, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. ACDI VOCA's mission is to achieve better lives for people and communities by increasing economic prosperity and social inclusion. We see the two things as integral and, and cannot be separated. So we cannot promote economic prosperity if we're not addressing the social issues that are related to that. And this means more than addressing women's empowerment and, and inclusion of women. It means thinking about what social inclusion means broadly. It means thinking about youth. It means thinking about 
uh, LGBTQI plus individuals, um, because the sexual and gender minorities are a historically and systemically excluded population who are absolutely essential to addressing this in this process. There are many negative impacts, as you've already stated, uh, to exclusion of this population. There's not just social stigma, um, but lost learning potential, lost earning potential, harassment, violence, uh, higher risks of homelessness that have negative uh, impacts from a social and psychological perspective, but also a food security and economic perspective that affects that population and all of us. LGBTQI plus uh, discrimination and stigma have significant impacts on food security. Now, data is lacking in this area. This is definitely a growing area where we need to do more research, but there have been multiple studies in the United States that have drawn this connection. Sexual and gender minorities experience disproportionately greater food insecurity in comparison to non-LGBTQI plus adults and different sex couples. The Williams Institute and other public health entities have released studies on this, which I'm happy to share. And this is due to factors such as underemployment, unemployment, wage differentials, workplace hiring discrimination, and increased risk of homelessness. So this is something that we really have to continue to look at in the populations and contexts where we're working. Um, research has also shown that transgender individuals and gender non-conforming people, as well as women who identify as lesbian and bisexual, tend to have lower incomes, even when they are employed, in comparison to other groups, which leads to increased food insecurity. We have a responsibility to pay attention to these differences and seek to address them. ACDI VOCA takes a systems approach when we look at addressing development and we cannot ignore these issues as we think about key leverage points and ways to strengthen the system for everyone. The economic costs of this discrimination impacts not just individuals and households, but markets and country level economies. This is something that we're all in together and need to address together. Our research in Honduras specifically found that LGBTQI plus youth leave rural areas at higher rates because of family and community rejection, which means this is also a migration impact. They move towards cities and urban areas, and this lack of staying power has economic costs to those rural communities, as well as the entire agriculture system. That there's a number of follow-on impacts that need to be understood and addressed. So there's a lot of information that we're starting to understand. There's a lot more data to collect. Um, and I really encourage people to look at research out of the Williams Institute, such as the 2019 study that looked at economic impacts in South Africa, uh, which actually revealed a $317 million cost due to wage discrimination and underemployment. So there's a lot of ways that we really need to think about how this is negatively impacting the LGBTQI plus community and everyone. Um, but there's so many positive outcomes that can be realized by including LGBTQI plus populations and enabling them to achieve their economic and social potential. Ensuring equitable access to education and training doesn't just promote po uh, productivity. It actually means that people are able to be who they are and do what they love, and their well-being improves, as does everyone's well-being. Studies overwhelmingly shows that businesses improve and benefit from greater diversity, more innovation, positive brand reputation, expansion into new market segments. There's so many positive outcomes from inclusion. So this is why we value this and promote it and seek to and continue to apply it. Great, thank you, Jen. And, and that was uh, a really uh, a lot of great additional information. And you know, even noting that we don't have a lot of great data, the data that we have really points to why we should be focusing in this area. Um, and we also know that food security is a priority at USAID and really the whole of US government. You know, today the White House is, is hosting a conference on food and nutrition issues here in the US. And so we know that it's not only our work abroad, but, but also here at home, um, that this is important for the US government. Um, and remarks at the recent launch of the, the uh, UN General Assembly uh, last week that just concluded um, was also uh, food and security was probably really a big part of that conversation. I wanted to turn it over to Elvin to see, um, you know, in your views, what are some other shocks and stressors that are really elevating this issue? And how do these impact LGBTQI plus persons uh, in addition to what uh, Jen just noted to us?
Buenos días eh, a todos, todas, todas. Pues es para mí eh, un placer estar acá y poder compartir cada experiencia, cada logro, cada trabajo que se ha hecho desde el Centro para el Desarrollo y la Cooperación LGTBI. Somos CDC en pro de la comunidad LGTBI en Honduras. Somos CDC hoy por hoy pues tiene la coordinación pues a nivel nacional con diferentes organizaciones alrededor de 24 a 26 grupos y organizaciones que ya han sido reconocidas por la institución como es lo que es la DIRSAD, que es la Dirección de Regulación y de Asociaciones Civiles, ¿no? Y también la coordinación a nivel regional. Desde ese enfoque, desde ese ámbito, somos se trabaja en diferentes programas, tal como el acceso a la justicia y pues para no irnos mucho más allá de los cinco programas y podernos enfocar en lo que es el empoderamiento económico de las personas LGTB en Honduras. Actualmente somos CDC parte de un estudio en el año 2017, en un estudio que se hace para poder ver el acceso económico de las personas LGTB en Honduras. Estudio pues prácticamente que nos arroja datos muy interesantes, datos pues que nos, que nos asombran y que nos motivan a poder trabajar en pro de la comunidad LGTB en Honduras en la parte del acceso económico, por ejemplo lo que es la creación de microempresas para la autosostenibilidad, ¿no? Sabemos que en Honduras las oportunidades laborales son escasas para las juventudes, así como para la población en general. Pero si hacemos énfasis o hacemos ecos en las poblaciones LGTBI, es aún más eh, el alto índice de desempleo que existe. Debido a esto, pues a las pocas oportunidades y también a lo que es eh, la, el acceso eh, o más que todo la discriminación hacia las personas, no por su orientación sexual, su expresión de género, su identidad de género. Eh, también la poca accesibilidad que existe en cuanto a, a lo que es los emprendimientos, ¿no? El poder accesar a un recurso económico financiero para poder tener lo que es una alternativa, ¿no? Al no tener un empleo como yo, poder tener una pequeña empresa con la cual yo poder subsistir. Entonces, eh, son bien difíciles los procesos act actualmente en la banca en Honduras. Es esto que nos motiva pues, a empoderar a las personas, a que podamos creer en nosotros que somos capaces y que podemos tener otras alternativas. ¿no? Creo que eh, para Somos CDC, pues, los programas eh, y proyectos desarrollados con USAID desde el año 2011 han sido pues, de una gran importancia ¿no? para nuestra institución, para nuestros beneficiarios, así como también para las personas que son eh, voluntarias de la organización y que han crecido y que han desarrollado herramientas a través de los diferentes procesos de formación, de empoderamiento que se les ha brindado. Eh, en la actualidad, pues, eh, sabemos que este tema eh, prácticamente es de fundamental o es fundamental para lo que es el desarrollo de las personas LGTBI. Creo que viene a, viene a cambiar lo que es, pues, calidad de vida, ¿no? Viene a empoderar viene a dar la, la inclusión de lo que es las personas LGTBI en este proceso. Creo de que Somos CDC pues eh, confía pues en lo que es la, eh, las personas LGTBI en el proceso, en su diario accionar, así como lo que es también pues defender, exigir sus derechos y poder seguir trabajando en la promoción, protección y defensa de los derechos humanos. Eh, pues en la actualidad sabemos que la tecnología juega un papel muy importante en el desarrollo económico de los países eh, emergentes o en vías de desarrollo como lo que es Honduras. Eh, temas como lo que es la seguridad alimentaria creo que son de vital importancia en el conocimiento y, en el, y prácticamente en la vida de las personas LGTBI. Eh, la población LGTBI en Honduras pues tiene diferentes eh, limitantes, diferentes limitaciones y esto es lo que eh, desde el Centro para el Desarrollo y la Cooperación nos motiva a seguir trabajando, a crear esas alianzas, a mantener esas alianzas con cooperantes y con la cooperación internacional, en este caso con USAID, que siempre ha estado pues enfrente ¿no? de lo que es la problemática LGTBI, empoderando, ha estado en la parte pues de, de apoyo fundamental en lo que es el crecimiento en materia de salud, en, la, en materia de lo que es eh, tecnologías, pues ahora en lo que es eh, empoderamiento económico y creo de que esto eh, nos alegra y nos motiva a seguir adelante y a poder seguir eh, manteniendo y reforzando esos lazos. Thank you, Elvin, for for kind of laying down what the situation is like in Honduras for LGBT plus folks. Um, and particularly uh, the different challenges that they are facing 
uh, and discrimination in, in all different sectors. Wanted to add just one quick follow up for you in terms of can you share kind of a, a one example of, of how SOMOS CDC is working to really uh, empower the community around uh, economics and, and agricultural issues? Sí, claro. Desde el programa de empoderamiento económico, eh, Somos CDC ha creado lo que es la escuela Yo Emprendo, una escuela pues prácticamente que brinda las herramientas para poder crear lo que son los planes de negocio. Eh, en la actualidad pues estamos fomentando ¿no? lo que es un negocio verde, ¿no? el poder incentivar pues a la, a la población a lo que es el cuidado del medio ambiente ¿no? en los diferentes procesos, ya sea en la prestación de servicios, así como lo que es en la elaboración de productos. ¿no? Eh, el tema pues de, de medio ambiente eh, en la actualidad para Somos CDC y el programa de empoderamiento económico creo que eh, está dando mucho auge no a, a, a apoyar esos proyectos pues que nos ayuden no a cuidar el medio ambiente también eso a conocer no de esos proyectos de eh, más que todo de seguridad alimentaria proyectos pues verdes que nos lleven no a otras áreas de trabajo a otros conocimientos que para la comunidad LGTBI pues son eh, son nuevos no sabemos que la comunidad LGTBI en Honduras ha estado más que todo trabajando en la parte de, de salud y derechos humanos no desde Somos CDC en el año 2016 eh, creemos que la población LGTBI debe o, de, o tiene que estar actualizada en otros procesos, en otros temas que son también parte del crecimiento, parte del fortalecimiento y parte de lo que nos va a ayudar a cambiar vidas, que nos va a ayudar pues a mantener las personas seguras en lo que es Honduras. Sabemos que el desplazamiento o la movilidad humana que se está dando en los últimos días es muy eh, alarmante no para la población LGTBI. Las organizaciones formamos eh, en procesos a las diferentes eh, organizaciones, las organizaciones a sus voluntarios, pero esos liderazgos, esas lideresas líderes, por motivos de falta de, de oportunidades migran o por inseguridad en Honduras migran a otros países. Eh, desde Somos CDC pues, se fortalece lo que son pequeños planes de negocio para que las personas puedan eh, tener lo que es una sostenibilidad, no poder tener un ingreso más dentro de nuestro país. Eh, en la actualidad, pues tenemos eh, desde Somos CDC 12 empresas eh, que, está, que son o que han sido fortalecidas desde Somos CDC y que estas empresas hoy por hoy pues mantienen o tienen alrededor de unas 50 a 70 personas beneficiarias indirectamente, directamente unas 17 a 21 personas y eh, pues que, que nos encantaría ¿no? que ese proceso, que este proyecto fuera a nivel nacional. ¿no? Es por eso que Somos CDC se mantiene en la constante gestión de recursos para poder tener ¿no? lo que son esas respuestas oportunas a la comunidad LGTBI para que de esta manera pues, eh, podamos tener lo que es esa forma de ingreso, esa forma de sostenibilidad y poder mejorar ¿no? lo que son vidas, eh, mejorar también la parte de los comportamientos y el empoderamiento. Eh, en el proceso de la formación pues, empresarial, como lo decía anteriormente, eh, nos enfocamos en diversos temas, ¿no? en lo que es la parte desde la, la autoestima, derechos humanos, eh, la conciencia ¿no? ambiental, también lo, lo que son los, eh, la parte financiera, que es muy importante ¿no? que las personas en la GTI la podamos conocer. Saber cómo poder mantener una empresa, saber cómo gestionar una empresa, saber cómo también poder... Eh, replicar esos conocimientos que muchas veces eh, se quedan en, en la mayoría de los seres, ¿no? Entonces, poder dar esos conocimientos a otras personas y que seamos un ejemplo. Somos CDC, pues siempre trata de conocer otras experiencias en otros países a fin de poderlas replicar en Honduras, a fin de poder tropicalizar esas ideas y que las podamos tener acá en Honduras como una alternativa para las personas LGTBI en diferentes temas como lo que es tecnología, medio ambiente, teoría alimentaria, entre otros temas. Eh, el saber ¿no? que USAID está to tomando o dando mucha importancia a lo que es este tema, a nosotros pues nos motiva y nos alegra mucho, porque sabemos que vamos a ser parte ¿no? de estos procesos, vamos a ser beneficiarios de estos procesos que nos van a ayudar a, en diferentes eh, ámbitos, ¿no? desde el empoderamiento, el conocimiento, hasta ser parte de esos cambios, ¿no? de esos cambios eh, internos, esos cambios personales y esos cambios alrededor ¿no? de nuestra comunidad que en la actualidad pues, sufre tanta estima, tanta discriminación, 
eh, por diferentes factores, ¿no? Y factores pues que a veces son eh, impulsados desde instancias que no deberían estar haciendo lo que es la apología al odio. Y, pero sin embargo, pues el trabajo de la comunidad LGTB en Honduras, cada día pues tratamos de unirnos más las diferentes organizaciones, unirnos un solo grupo para trabajar pues en fin de la comunidad y en pro de la comunidad LGTB. Thank you, Alvin, uh, for that, uh, for giving us more context uh, around the situation in Honduras and also how SOMO CDC is really working to bridge the connection between uh, the, the work in agriculture and food security and market systems. And I think this is a, a really great way to bring in Katia um, and to, to share more about the transforming market activity uh, that you all are doing in Honduras and how you are able to um, work with SOMO CDC and, and forming this partnership uh, to link these two uh, really important issues that can support the LGBT Cry Plus community together. So Katia, um, can you tell us more about the Transforming Market Systems activity uh, and how you were able to form the partnership with SOMO CDC? Well, um, the goal of our project is to generate economic opportunities to reduce incentives to migrate. The way we do so is through a market systems development approach. This approach is focused on building systems, local systems, the systems where people, companies, and institutions interact to be more competitive, resilient, and inclusive. It is only through these three characteristics that a system is robust enough to grow and become sustainable. So you can see that inclusion is a core part of our goals and is reflected throughout our activities. Our strategies make emphasis on increasing the inclusion of women, youth, and indigenous and LGBTQI plus populations. In order to make inclusion intentional in our work, we deliberately engage with SOMO CDC because they are a local LGBTQI plus organization and they have over 24 alliances with other LGBTQI plus groups nationwide. So this makes them a super important node in the system. During our engagement, we opened all of our portfolio for consideration. We wanted to know where the strategic opportunities for LGBTQI plus were. For example, TMS has massive employment programs, including agriculture and food systems, also in digital jobs, tourism, creative industries, electronic commerce, and temporary work overseas, as well as even jobs in the cruise ship industry. Each of these areas has potential for inclusion. We have some examples currently of LGBTQI plus owned businesses participating in our activities in the food processing industry and working successfully in agricultural companies. We have connected with them to understand more about their experiences in the sectors and they have shared with us the challenges that they face as they do not feel comfortable openly identifying as LGBTQI plus due to the stigma and discrimination that they face in this given context. So with our interaction, learning, and joint efforts with Somos ASA, we uh, think it can be a good first step towards better engaging and being prepared to actively support these groups. Great, thank you for that, Katia, and, and, and just elucidating a little bit uh, around how you all form the partnership with SOMO CDC and, and with the transforming market systems activity. Um, that's really great to hear. And you know, you list a lot of challenges that we often hear uh, from LGBT Cry Plus uh, groups and in, in environments where it might be really difficult to be able to, to work openly uh, in, in their situations. But it's always really important to be able to have those conversations and still be able to bring them into our programs and activities to, to find ways to support them. Um, I wanted to, uh, one, just make a pitch. If you have uh, questions that uh, are coming up while you are listening to our, our really uh, delightful speakers and experts on this area, uh, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A uh, function so that we can get your questions um, and uh, we will be able to get to answering them uh, throughout the event. 
Um, but I wanted to uh, turn it over to Angeles and see if, Angeles, can you share how programs like this have supported LGBT tri plus inclusion in Honduras's economy and really what you think are the long term impacts uh, that these activities will have? Uh, and then additionally, can you discuss the potential impact climate change on this work, which we know is impacting um, all of our lives in, in so many different ways? So, Angeles, over to you. Bueno, muy buenos días a todos y a todas y a todes. Eh, realmente es un placer que nos permitan ser parte de, de este conversatorio, ¿verdad? Y eh, bueno, pues, ¿de qué manera impacta? Es el hecho de que nos abren una puerta para poder darles oportunidades a nuestros jóvenes LGTBI, ya que hoy en día, como lo han venido diciendo las personas eh, anteriores que han tenido la participación, eh, como personas LGTBI muchas veces se nos priva tener las mismas oportunidades que las personas heterosexuales y esto pues obviamente se debe al estigma y la discriminación eh, que la sociedad tiene para con las personas LGTBI, ¿no? Ahora el impacto que tiene eh, USAID y el programa Transformando Sistemas de Mercado con respecto a Somos CDC es el hecho de poder aperturar diferentes espacios de diferentes formas de trabajo. Tenemos eh, lo que son los microwork que ha venido sin duda a darle esa manera tan fácil de poder generar ingresos y poder de esta manera solventar las necesidades que no solamente el joven LGTBI, sino la familia en general, ¿no? Sabemos que eh, muchas veces eh, nosotros las personas LGTBI somos el sustento de nuestras familias. Entonces, al momento en que nos den, que nos dan esta oportunidad, no solamente es para nosotros, sino que vienen eh, beneficiarios indirectos. Nosotros venimos y arrastramos beneficiarios indirectos cuando nos dan este tipo de oportunidades. Tenemos lo que es el comercio el comercio digital, que sin duda, sin duda es una manera de impulsar el marketing digital y en lo que hemos hecho es justamente con nuestros emprendedores, que era lo que mencionaba el compañero Elvin, estas personas que, que hemos logrado que logren emprender, que logren establecer su microempresa y con el comercio digital lo que venimos es impulsar, darle un valor agregado a estos emprendimientos, a estas microempresas que puedan ser reconocidas ya en un ámbito digital, lo que quiere decir que van a tener un amplio mercado. Otras personas van a estar viendo que esta empresa está disponible, que este negocio está disponible, los productos que este negocio está impulsando, lo que tiene. Y pues estamos a la espera de lo que son las visas de trabajo, las visas temporales que sin duda algunas sabemos que nuestros jóvenes van a estar más que agradecidos y van a ser más que beneficiados con estas oportunidades. Cuando hablamos del impacto eh, del cambio climático, pues sin duda vemos que es un daño colateral ¿no? a, estos, a estos emprendimientos que pues lastimosamente no lo podemos evitar, ¿no? Eh, pero sin duda sabemos que a pesar de, de todas estas dificultades, de todos estos cambios, o el impacto que el cambio climático pueda tener en los negocios, se ha tratado de siempre tener como, de darle una solvencia, ¿no? De, de siempre impulsar, por ejemplo, medidas de bioseguridad, siempre tener eh, medidas, eh, protocolos que, que nuestros emprendedores siempre eh, puedan tener y puedan tomar en cuenta cualquier inconveniente que se les pueda presentar y de esta manera brindarles las herramientas para saber cómo contrarrestar la dificultad que se les está presentando. Sabemos que acabamos de pasar por problemas como ETA e IOTA que sin duda vinieron a dificultarnos mucho más a las personas LGTBI, que muchas personas tuvieron que cerrar sus empresas y que muchas personas que tuvieran que desplazarse forzosamente a otros países buscando oportunidades. Creo que esta es la manera del impacto del cambio climático en, en las personas LGTBI y en los emprendimientos que las personas LGTBI han obtenido a través del programa que nosotros eh, pues estamos trabajando, que es empoderamiento económico y eh, que pues con, te, con, con transformando sistemas de mercado pues hemos venido a fortalecerles y hemos venido a darle un valor agregado a lo que es nuestro trabajo. Thank you, Angeles, for that. And yes, unfortunately, climate change is really uh, collateral, damaging a lot of the work that we're doing in many different sectors. But you know, particularly in this one, as you mentioned, 
uh, for for businesses, for entrepreneurs uh, that are working in this space. Um, Jen, I wanted to come back to you. Um, you've kind of heard a little bit about uh, this program and activity in Honduras, but from your perspective at ACDI VOCA, I wonder if you could share um, some other examples that you are aware of in the region or globally. Um, and then in, in addition, also be able to kind of speak to the funding landscape uh, in this space and any obstacles um, that development practitioners face in moving LGBTQI plus inclusive farming um, forward. Absolutely. Um, in the region, uh, we we also have a, a large portfolio of work in, in Colombia, and there are several ways that we work to promote uh, the inclusion of LGBTQI plus communities and individuals. Um, we have several projects uh, working in that context, uh, and they work to integrate these topics into existing gender, uh, youth, and social inclusion work as part of an intersectional approach. There's a variety of ways that they, they do this. Um, this can mean working with communities uh, through a methodology uh, that they call Decido Ser, um, which, which actually is a behavior change, social inclusion, approach which actually does a lot to promote acceptance and engagement around these topics and, and does specifically include sexual and gender identity. Um, it's really important for promoting uh, social and behavior change at multiple levels, particularly at the community level. There's also an approach called Inclusion S, which is really uh, an important and, and has become an effective tool for working with the private sector, with institutions, government agencies, um, the media, where we look at and support organizations and thinking about how are they adopting and applying inclusion and, and specifically include sexual and gender minorities. Um, and, and this is where we really are trying to get at the enabling environment as well as organizational culture in order to promote opportunities uh, for this community. These programs have also done uh, specifically targeted and focused interventions to provide services and opportunities for uh, these populations as well. So they form partnerships for, um, and pardon me, my Spanish is not great, um, the Fundacion Sergio David Urego, uh, where they support youth and, and caring adults in their lives as part of suicide prevention, brought about by discrimination. Um, they've also formed other partnerships to support transgender and non-binary people and their families through a range of interventions, which range from psychosocial support, political and civic engagement, access to legal services and rights, um, which support as well opportunities for, for economic engagement. Um, so there's a range in which these programs operate acknowledging the links between the social support and the economic advancement for these communities. Um, and so, so there's a lot of uh, opportunities in Colombia through the, their work. We also do this work in uh, the Philippines and um, take a slightly different tack. Uh, the USDA Phil Cafe project is working specifically in the coffee sector. They work with uh, coffee cooperatives, but also as part of this work, they're working with education institutions, state colleges and universities. And originally the approach of course is focusing on technical skills, building youth opportunities to uh, engage in the agriculture sector, um, and really improve that educational pipeline and extension services. But one of the things we found was um, that while the Philippines has a uh, government support for gender and, and, and social inclusion, there was still significant sexual harassment and discrimination against LGBTQ communities and individuals. So they actually partnered with our project to improve the learning environment and, and teach facilitators and professors, excuse me, teach professors facilitative skills to create a supportive learning environment and, and really uh, address LGBTQ exclusion, um, which has the added benefit not only of ensuring that LGBTQI plus identifying students can access these technical skills in a safe learning environment, but it promotes expanded social norms that say this is an inclusive community, this is an inclusive sector, and there's a place for everyone here. So we're hoping uh, that this actually promotes not just immediate access, but we're really thinking in terms of the long-term and social change. So uh, those are two examples, and there's going to be a, a blog post coming out on AgriLinks about this, um, the Philippines uh, program as well. 
In terms of funding, um, one of the things that I think, you know, we're really excited to hear about the new funding opportunities coming out of USA. That's always exciting to see. The grant opportunities for local organizations are so important. Um, but one of the challenges we have certainly faced, and I, I know that this is a chorus that we hear across the industry, as, as I mentioned earlier, the lack of data is, is really important, and we have to have data in order to design and implement these programs safely and effectively, which means we can't just add this on. Um, we, we really need to understand the context. We really need to design these programs thoughtfully. We need to engage local partners in ways that are supportive and, and smart. Um, and that means not only uh, our donors really need to be with us uh, and, and signal that this is a priority and signal that through resourcing. So that's everything from making sure that organizations have access to the expertise that is needed, everything from the home office to the local context, to collecting the necessary information that we can use to make sure that we're making the right engagements, the right choices, the right partners, partnerships, all along the way and in implementing a do no harm approach in that process. So that is a funding challenge, especially when this is linked in or, or combined with other social inclusion approaches that sometimes um, are not necessarily prioritized uh, to the same degree as some of the technical approaches, but they need to be given equivalent priority for us to be able to do this effectively. Great, thank you, Jen, for that. And, you know, the two things that came up as you were speaking um, in, in the examples that you shared from around the world and, and some of uh, the engagement that ACDI VOCA has been part of is that this is really a multidisciplinary uh, work that we're doing here, as you talked about in the Philippines and working through uh, education systems and, and, and working with uh, professors, um, as you talked about, um, the, the other work that's happening in, in other spaces, right? This is not just uh, about agricultural or just markets. It's about all different types of work. And unfortunately, USAID is involved in all of those types of work. And so there are many ways that folks can really be involved uh, with strengthening uh, LGBT pride plus folks uh, in market systems and agricultural uh, work uh, for inclusion. So that's that's really great. And then the other point, that you hit on in terms of data um, is, you know, we are, are right there with you that data is really important. Um, and, some, and it's been really hard to get data uh, on LGBTQI plus persons uh, within the development space. Um, you know, I, that's part of uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do is, is make sure that we are getting SOGI-esque inclusive data across USAID's programming. Um, and we, uh, over the summer, had a, a job uh, out for uh, someone to come and support us in writing some technical guidance uh, and creating trainings on how to really uh, guide our own staff and implementing partners and how we can uh, safely gather, store, and utilize uh, SOGIS data, knowing that in many of the places where we work, um, getting that data can be extra challenging and difficult. Um, but we wanna be able to do it uh, and do it right and safely and uh, working in partnership with a lot of the local communities uh, that we are engaged with there. Um, so that is a really important point. Um, I see that there are questions coming in, to, uh, coming in for us through the Q&A function, as well as I think a few through uh, the chat box. So to all of those that are listening in and participating, thank you for sending in your questions. Uh, continue doing that. Uh, we're gonna have uh, one last round of questions for all of our presenters. Uh, and then we're going to turn it over to our Q&A time. Uh, so we'll be uh, using that time to answer and respond to some of the questions that you've already submitted, um, but continue sending those in uh, so that we can really hear from you and make this as engaging and useful uh, a session uh, for everyone to really talk about how we are strengthening uh, the work that we're doing for inclusion in this space. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn to our, our last set of questions that all of our participants uh, will be able to answer. And Elvin, I wanted to start with you. Uh, I know that we haven't heard from you in a minute, so I would love to get your perspective. Um, but really as a last question, um, Elvin, how do you recommend market development experts partner with LGBTQI plus led organizations to advance these priorities that we've been talking about here? 
Um, what recommendations do you have for successful cooperation and partnership uh, that really ensures LGBT Pride Plus people can be included in the agricultural and food sectors? Um, and then lastly, is there anything that we should avoid? And we'll start with uh, Elvin, and then we'll go to Katia, uh, and then I'll, I'll uh, see who we're going to go to after that. But Elvin, up to you first. Gracias. Bueno, creo de que eh, siempre hemos considerado desde Somos CDC lo que es eh, partir ¿no? de un diagnóstico. Partir de un diagnóstico de, de necesidades en lo que es la parte pues, agrícola. Sabemos que en Honduras eh, el trabajo de las organizaciones LGTBI se ha enfocado más en lo que es eh, lugares como lo que es el Distrito Central, San Pedro Sula, la Ceiba, Tela, o estamos hablando de zonas centro, sur, norte, ¿no? Pero sabemos que la parte de la agricultura en nuestro país se da en el área noroccidental y, eh, o, o sea, estamos hablando de departamentos como relacionados a, a Copán, eh, parte de la zona lenca, todo esto, y en otros como Olancho, Choluteca, el paraíso, ¿no? Que son parte de, algunos son parte del este y otros del oeste. Y en esta zona sabemos que la cobertura de las organizaciones LGTBI ha, ha sido escasa. Ha sido escasa por diversos factores, como ser pues, prácticamente la discriminación y el estigma, ya que estos son eh, prácticamente sectores o departamentos de Honduras conservadores. Eh, es más, eh, si podemos identificar lideresas o liderazgos, son pocos. Las personas que han levantado, han alzado la voz y es por eso eh, que consideramos ¿no? que el trabajo debería ser prácticamente como una introducción ¿no? de lo que es temas de inclusión en esta zona. El poder coordinar alianzas con sectores eh, agrícolas ¿no? que al día de hoy pues, ha sido bien difícil para la comunidad LGTBI. Ha sido bien difícil por factores que ya mencioné y que sin embargo nuestras organizaciones han entrado con algunos temas como lo que es el acceso a la justicia, que somos CDC, prácticamente, y la Mesa de Acceso a la Justicia Nacional entró en estas zonas a eh, abordar temas, ¿no?, de lo que es mm, seguridad con operadores de, con, perdón, valga la redundancia, con operadores de seguridad y justicia. Fue bien, fue bien, o fue un reto, ¿no?, en el que Somos CDC, pues, le apostó. Sin embargo, fue un proceso muy, muy bonito, muy participativo. En ese sentido, pues, quisiéramos de que eh, se hicieran, ¿no?, lo que son esas alianzas, esas coordinaciones, y también el poder capacitar a nuestra población, ¿no?, en lo que es la parte, eh, en temas como la parte agrícola, ¿no? Sabemos que es algo muy importante, es algo muy novedoso para la comunidad, porque no hemos trabajado al día de hoy en estos temas. Sin embargo, estamos impulsando, ¿no?, desde Somos CDC, el poder tener esa conciencia agrícola, esa conciencia verde, como lo decía en la primera intervención, a través de nuestro programa de empoderamiento económico. Hemos, eh, estamos en sinergia con otras organizaciones en poder entrar en estas zonas, ¿no?, para poder capacitar a las personas en lo que es un tema de derechos humanos y por ahí ir metiendo, ¿no?, lo que es la parte o el tema LGTBI para no entrar de una manera, pues, brusca, una manera muy rotunda y que se nos puedan cerrar los, las puertas, ¿no?, a los procesos, eh, sino que buscar esas estrategias, esas alianzas de acercamiento a lo que son esos sectores, así como lo que es a los diferentes eh, organizaciones, ¿no?, que trabajan en el tema, el tema agrícola. Eh, queremos que nuestra comunidad, pues, sea, sea prácticamente eh, o participe, ¿no?, de estos procesos de una manera, pues, muy muy disciplinada, de una manera pues muy, muy oportuna, ¿no? Para que podamos ir conociendo eh, el tema, ¿no? Como sabemos que es un tema nuevo, entonces tenemos que tratar de empoderar primero, dar, dar el conocimiento, brindar el conocimiento para que las personas puedan eh, tener, ¿no? Ya lo que es una noción, ¿no? De qué es lo que se pretende, cómo se va a hacer y eh, cuáles van a ser los, los beneficios, ¿no? En el tema de inclusión de las personas LGTBI. Consideramos de que desde USAID, pues, eh, es un proyecto que ya ha, ha considerado para Honduras y que ya están en práctica en otros países de la región. Eh, sabemos que los contextos, pues, son diferentes, pero a pesar de tener contextos diferentes a nivel regional, pues, Honduras lo puede hacer y lo va a lograr siempre y cuando, pues, trabajemos unidos y trabajemos 
en conjunto pues, en la parte de las alianzas y en la parte del empoderamiento de la población LGTBI con una inclusión más que todo amplia y una inclusión en diversos temas, ¿no? Más allá de lo que es mm, eh, la participación política, la inclusión económica, sino que temas que eh, sean temas novedosos, ¿no? No dejando atrás también los temas de la tecnología, que son muy importantes hoy en día para nuestra comunidad. Great, um, Ellen, thank you for those recommendations uh, for, for everyone here and from your perspective from SOMO CDC. I uh, want to turn it to Katia now to share any recommendations or um, things that we should be avoiding as we are working in this space. Well, um, what I would recommend is having an LGBTQI plus organization, you know, such as Somos CDC in an advisory role and informing the design of activities, especially those that have rural membership, when, where we know it's even more challenging to involve people um, of the LGBTQI plus community. These partnerships can help create awareness in our work in our, within our own projects and with the partners that we work with. It also helps to generate harassment and discrimination prevention campaigns that are very much needed for inclusive spaces. Through our partnership with Somos CDC, we have identified opportunities to not only increase LGBTQI plus participation, but also to obtain accurate data because Somos CC monitors closely uh, the individuals that are participating in our programs and they help them feel safe and comfortable self-identifying in our data and in our forms. So I think the key element here is to involve them in all of the parts of the process and to keep constant communication with them to identify any possible issues and barriers and to work through them to find ways in which we can overcome them together. You know, it is very important to not do anything about them without them. So, you know, get out to this organization, to these individuals, get all the information on the context and being able to gather their recommendations and collaborate to create something involving them in every part of the process. Since that uh, this is the community that we're actively trying to involve more within our initiative. Great, thank you, Katia. And it's really great that you mentioned that principle of nothing about us without us and that you all are really utilizing that principle to do this work and to be inclusive of LGBT tribe plus communities. Uh, that is something that has been part of USAID's uh, principles for working in the LGBT tribe plus inclusive development space since 2014. And you know, part of that principle is to be able to utilize the expertise of the community uh, and helping them, as you said, bringing them into the design process early to co-design the work that uh, ultimately is going to be benefiting from them. And so they need to be part of early on uh, of that process of, of setting the activity goals and design of that. So it's really great to see you all living and breathing uh, the true spirit of that principle. Wanted to turn it over to Jen to see what recommendations um, or things that we should avoid uh, that you want to share with folks? Well, I agree very much with what's been shared. I, I definitely think um, avoiding trying to do this work without engaging the local population is, is very important. Um, I think another thing that is really important is uh, avoiding doing harm. Um, it's extremely important that uh, that we maintain uh, a safety approach, a do no harm approach, or a do no further harm approach in everything we do. And, and I think the points that have been raised previously um, are so important. But I think uh, in thinking about this do no harm approach, there are many different ways that, uh, that it needs to be applied. Um, and that first and foremost is certainly engaging uh, with local partners, um, but also maintaining uh, the safety of those local partners and the safety of, of staff, the safety of staff at multiple levels, the safety of everyone 
That means data safety. Um, it means also thinking about how we're using the information that we collect and, and how we're engaging with this uh, community and how we're really thinking about our approach uh, in, in this project. Um, one of the things we've been very mindful of is, is making sure that, um, that we're not simply counting heads or collecting information for information's sake, but that we're really seeking to understand the context. We're seeking to understand the presence of sexual and gender minorities, what the challenges are, what the systemic issues and norms are, how this affects this population and their ability to participate and benefit in an agriculture and market system, what the opportunities are to address that, um, but also what the scope is of our role, um, and, and also to know who else is out there, who can we engage with, and what the broader context is. It's really important to avoid um, a scope creep that is, is not appropriate, but also avoid thinking that we have to do this alone and that we're in isolation. Uh, so it's really important to build that uh, that relationship, those partnerships, and really think about this from a systemic approach um, and how all of these systems work together in order to do this safely and, and effectively, but also to make sure that people are included and comfortable and, and safe in the process. Because as we know, there, there are very different contexts. Honduras and Colombia are not the same. Uh, and, and there are many countries around the world where the contexts are very different. The other thing that uh, we need to avoid doing is assuming that the sexual and gender minorities are all the same. It's something that's really important for us to do is to know that uh, lesbian women and, and uh, gay men and bisexual individuals and transgender individuals also have unique needs that should be understood and addressed, and they cannot be treated as a monolithic. So that also means us, again, listening, understanding, and working with local communities and customizing our approaches to the needs that they share with us. So it's really important for us to be intersectional as well, because there's also age ranges. People are young, people grow up, people move through different life stages. So there is so much in terms of understanding differentiation and intersectionality, which means this is complex, but it's extremely important that we do it. Thank you for that, Jen. And yes, that, that last point on intersectionality is really important uh, because we all have multiple identities, right? and bring uh, with those uh, identities different experiences and perspectives uh, to solutions to problems like this. And it's really important that we bring all those different perspectives to the table because we're going to get that much more creativity in the solutions that are going to be put forward uh, for, for how we work in this space. And so I think that is a really, really important point. Um, want to uh, end our last formal question in the discussion with Angeles and in asking uh, you in terms of what are your recommendations uh, for development experts uh, to work with LGBT Pride Plus led organizations? Um, and what are some things that we should be avoiding as we are working in this space? Bueno, más que recomendaciones es pues siempre solicitar ¿no? la apertura, que nos den los espacios, que podamos mantener esa sinergia y este y poder continuar tejiendo este tipo de alianzas que lo que permite es pues darnos un lugar, darnos el lugar que realmente merecemos y que necesitamos, teniendo eh, brindando pues las mismas oportunidades para todos. Entonces creo que eso sería más que todo, no es recomendación, sino siempre resaltar que la sinergia, las alianzas, Y los espacios brindados es lo más importante para las personas LGTBI porque nos hacen sentir que realmente somos parte de algo. Como lo mencionaba Jen anteriormente, cada una de las poblaciones representadas en la nomenclatura LGTBI tenemos necesidades completamente diferentes. ¿verdad? No podemos decir que las necesidades de una mujer lesbiana son las mismas necesidades de una mujer trans. Entonces, al tener este tipo de espacios, podemos ir identificando las necesidades que cada una de estas poblaciones representadas tienen y de qué manera vamos a ir abordando y poder suplir, suplir las necesidades que todos tenemos para poder realmente tener una vida digna y poder tener una sociedad digna y que todos podamos compartir disfrutando de los mismos derechos.
Thank you for that, Angeles. And I think you really wrapped it up and, and, and summarized it well for all of us uh, in terms of those recommendations. Um, I'm really excited because we have gotten a lot of questions from our audience members and attendees. And so um, we're gonna use uh, this last portion of our webinar to get to some of those. So thank you for all of uh, our participants that are providing questions and we're gonna try to get to get through uh, responding to as many of them as we can. Um, so hope that yours, uh, we can respond to yours. Uh, I think this was the first question that was submitted. So this is a question for all of our panelists. Um, so feel, feel free to chime in. Uh, but the question comes into um, how can we in the digital agricultural technology world help support and encourage inclusivity for LGBTQI plus persons? And I know I think someone had mentioned the the, the digital component, but um, anyone uh, can hop in and respond to this question in terms of the digital agricultural technology and inclusion. Sí, bien. Yo eh, mencionaba la parte digital que no la olvidáramos porque en los procesos no eh, más en los últimos años sabemos que eso es de vital. Eh, cruce no entre los diferentes temas eh, nos gustaría pues que este este proceso o prácticamente la inclusión de las personas LGBTI en la parte agrícola se haga pues como lo decía anteriormente desde un diagnóstico en el cual las personas LGBTI seamos parte no de la creación de esas herramientas de esos acercamientos Eh, porque eh, si bien es cierto, sabemos, conocemos cuál es nuestro contexto, cual, conocemos cuáles son nuestras necesidades, con los, conocemos cuáles son nuestras zonas a nivel de país en las cuales eh, la, la población LGTBI tiene los conocimientos, tiene las herramientas necesarias y también conocemos las limitantes ¿no? que existen en las diferentes eh, instancias ¿no? eh, a nivel nacional, llámese de gobierno, llámese de sociedad civil, con las cuales la población LGTBI ha tenido el acercamiento, ya sea de manera efectiva o de manera negativa, en la cual pues no ha habido la inclusividad o no ha habido la inclusión necesaria. Entonces creo que la participación de la comunidad de LGTBI en la creación de metodologías de trabajo, en la creación de, de herramientas, en la creación de, de las tecnologías a aplicar, o de los procesos tecnológicos a aplicar esta importancia, ¿no? Eh, sabemos que también contamos con poblaciones de muy escasos recursos en los cuales no hay acceso también pues, a tecnología. Personas que quizás son del ámbito rural, que eh, de, en el de momento pues sabemos que eh, desde las organizaciones el trabajo ha sido escaso por diversos factores, ¿no? Diversos factores que ya conocemos como lo que es el financiamiento o el, o el que las organizaciones puedan tener ¿no? eh, proyectos para estas zonas. Eh, sabemos que hay cooperaciones que ya tienen definidas sus áreas de trabajo, ¿no? por ejemplo, dicen en zona norte o en zona sur, en zona centro, pero eh, ¿qué pasa con los otros mm, departamentos del este, del oeste de Honduras, donde no hay cobertura, donde no hay cooperación internacional presente, donde no hay organizaciones LGTBI conformadas por, el, por la misma estigma, por la misma discriminación? Entonces creo de, de, que tiene que ser un trabajo en conjunto ¿no? con las organizaciones para poder fortalecer esos liderazgos de las zonas y que estas personas puedan ser los actores principales de cada zona, ¿no? valga la redundancia. Y que desde nuestras organizaciones, como somos CDC, podamos ser los, los, por des, los, los que dan el seguimiento, los que dan el apoyo, los que dan el empoderamiento para que podamos trabajar en, y co, cubrir ¿no? estas zonas que por años han estado pues, en el abandono. Estamos hablando de sectores pues, indígenas, eh, sectores campesinos, donde hay población, donde hay presencia LGTBI, pero por, por el miedo, eh, el rechazo, la discriminación y todo, por su cultura o por su apego, o su rasgo cultural, pues no, no tienen el valor de poder decir soy una persona LGTBI y voy a trabajar por los derechos LGTBI en la parte de la inclusión económica, en la parte de la inclusión laboral, porque eh, quizás eh, la cultura se nos ha dicho en estas zonas que eh, no podemos mencionar el tema LGTBI. Entonces creo de que eh, como organizaciones 
en este caso somos CDC, conocemos las zonas, conocemos el trabajo, conocemos los liderazgos y sí nos gustaría, pues con, en este caso con USAID, poder tener un trabajo en conjunto, un trabajo en el cual podamos identificar estas zonas que han estado, pues, más que todo eh, atrás, ¿no?, de los diferentes procesos que la, su participación ha sido mínima, pero que sin embargo tienen la necesidad y tienen el deseo de poder participar. Es cuestión de empoderarlos, es cuestión de enseñarles cuáles son sus derechos, cuáles son sus deberes como personas LGTBI, porque también tenemos deberes como cualquier ciudadano, y también poder tener esa inclusión y que sea una inclusión a nivel nacional. ¿no? Entonces creo de que a manera de, de, de poder tener pues una... Una reflexión, ¿no? Es que como cooperación incluyamos a otros sectores, a otros departamentos de Honduras, no solamente los principales donde está la, por decir así, la, la voluntad política o, o el poder político, en este caso, pues, el Distrito Central, eh, San Pedro Sula, Tela Ceiba, ¿no? Sino que otros departamentos en los cuales también hay necesidad y hay trabajo mucho por hacer, mucho camino por recorrer, muchos cambios de comportamiento a las personas y también inclusión hacia estas personas que también necesitan como los mismos procesos que nosotros ya hemos desarrollado y los mismos procesos que nos tienen hoy acá o que me tienen hoy acá frente a cada uno de ustedes dando a conocer eh, cuál es nuestra situación actual de las personas LGTBI en Honduras en estos momentos en el año 2022. Es un trabajo que como somos CDC ha sido pues ya por más de 15 años eh, prácticamente eh, conocedores ¿no? de esas necesidades, de esas barreras que nos han limitado y que sin embargo pues seguimos acá, eh, creemos en nosotros, creemos en un Said que siempre está de la mano y creemos también en las demás personas aliadas, en este caso sociedad civil, algunas organizaciones de Estado pues que han dicho presente y que nos mantenemos pues en constante trabajo. Entonces como bien lo decía la compañera Ángeles, eh, debemos de trabajar, debemos de cambiar y eh, cambios que nos generen conocimiento, que nos generen cambios de comportamiento y que nos generen una mejor calidad de vida. Solamente. Thank, thank you for that, Elvin. And, and yes, you are, are highlighting a lot of the uh, expertise that you all bring, that LGBT Cry Plus organizations and groups bring to the work that we should be utilizing and working in partnership uh, with with you all um, for that expertise that you bring to the table. So thanks for that. Um, are there any other folks that maybe want to uh, answer this uh, question around uh, digital agricultural technology and, and LGBTQI plus inclusion before we go on to the next question? I would just briefly say that I think Elvin's raised some really important points, um, but there, are certainly questions around um, the access to the technology. So I think engaging with local organizations and you know, engaging with this community around what are the challenges in accessing and using this technology would certainly be important. But also again, thinking about context and thinking about uh, what the potential um, use of the technology is and, and any risks involved. So depending on context, um, is information being shared where people can be tracked using the app or using the, the handset or the, the technology um, is really important to consider uh, in certain environments, in certain contexts. So there's a layer of do no harm, safety and security that needs to be considered with engaging a, a, a population like this one. Okay, thank you for those ad uh, additions, Jen. Um, the next question I think uh, will direct it to Katia and maybe others folks uh, can chime in after, but this is specifically for the transforming market systems uh, activity. Um, Katia, we got a question in that says, uh, what are some factors that provide incentives for young LGBTQI plus people who, who stay in rural areas to be engaged in agricultural related work and businesses? Involved within, you know, agricultural activities. Um, I think, you know, currently it's, or it has always been very challenging because um, in rural areas, sometimes they do not feel as welcomed or they can face 
specific discrimination in agriculture, with which we know is a very tough sector in this area of inclusion of LGBTQI people, also of women. So it is something we are trying to work on, like agriculture as a whole. We know that right now with climate change, it, they they face many many hardships, many barriers, and it's each time harder and harder for youth to be involved. That's why we, within our agricultural projects, we try to incentivize um, a generational approach so that the people that are currently involved can also involve their children and that their children can also be involved in the future in order for us to, you know, contribute to food safety and to accompany these people through this hardship and improving the, these conditions. But I think in general, we must work um, with, first of all, LGBTQI organizations in rural areas, if we can find them or the ones that are closer to them. That sometimes we feel that, you know, they are underrepresented and that we might not find them. But if we ask the right people, we can learn about these organizations and the work they're doing in rural areas and also putting special emphasis on trying to create awareness of inclusion in performing campaigns that go against nation and harassment. And I think that that is the basis of it. Work with a generational approach in order for youth in general to be included within this productive activity and also to generate uh, awareness of the importance of inclusion and to fight discrimination and violence against LGBTQI plus people in every chance that we can get. Great, thank you for that, Katia. And, and maybe we'll, we'll say, because we got a, a couple other questions around just working in rural areas and how to do LGBTQI plus inclusion in those spaces. Uh, so so this is for, for anyone to answer, but maybe uh, uh, particularly Katia or, or Angeles, could answer, you know, um, one question asked about um, the level of openness or resistance of, of uh, non-LGBT cry plus persons in rural areas to work on LGBT cry plus inclusion and participate uh, in that. Um, the other related question is, you know, in terms of rural municipalities and townships, you know, what are the resources, what kind of access um, have you all seen to really get LGBTQI plus inclusion and advance some of the work that we've been talking about here. And so maybe um, if, if some of our, our folks could answer either one of those questions. Bueno, eh, yo creo que antes que nada, solo para darle un pequeño aporte a la, a la consulta que le habían realizado a Katia, creo que es el poder transformar el trabajo a nivel intersectorial lo que permite un mayor acceso a los diferentes departamentos o a las diferentes, eh, por ejemplo, en este caso, las personas ya en las áreas rurales. Cuando hablamos de una in intersectorialidad es porque estamos hablando de que vamos a trabajar de una, de una manera más amplia. Con respecto a las municipalidades desde Somos CDC, en este caso estamos impulsando una política municipal contra la discriminación, entonces eso nos permite poder acceder o poder eh, tener un trabajo más cerca con las comunidades, con estas comunidades, como lo dicen, donde no hay una organización LGTBI, donde las personas posiblemente no tengan su reconocimiento de identidad, de su orientación sexual, identidad o expresión de género, por la misma discriminación y por el mismo estigma que se vive con mayor eh, rango, ¿verdad? Con mayor porcentaje en estas áreas rurales, porque sabemos que es eh, donde las áreas son más conservadoras. Entonces, cuando hablamos de esta política en contra de la, eh, a la no discriminación, una política municipal a la no discriminación, estamos hablando no solamente de las personas LGTBI, hablamos de todas las personas, de todos los grupos en sentido de vulnerabilidad. Estamos hablando de la mujer, estamos hablando de los niños, estamos hablando de los jóvenes, de las personas migrantes, de las personas con discapacidad. Estamos hablando ya de, un, de una manera más amplia de inclusión, no solo el reconocer o no solo eh, 
respetar una orientación sexual, sino también tener ese respeto de una manera general por todas las personas y aún más a las personas en las áreas rurales. Sabemos que también hoy en día se vive el estigma y la discriminación hacia las personas indígenas, indígenas y afrodescendientes. Entonces también de esta manera Somos CDC está haciendo una lucha más amplia, más allá de solo defender los derechos de las personas LGTBI. Thank you for that, Amelis. And, and anyone else kind of want to respond to the, the questions around working in rural areas uh, on LGBT card plus issues? No? All right, I think we have then uh, one last question um, really around data. And I think uh, maybe, uh, Jen, if you could help us answer this, uh, it would be really great. Uh, we have a question in terms of how have you been able to collect LGBTQI plus specific data? Um, are there any resources that you can share? Um, and then as you talk about what data you have collected, um, what are the type of indicators and outputs uh, that you think are needed in order to really leverage USAID funding uh, towards getting better data for program design? Um, and then lastly, um, what are any concerns about identifying LGBT CRI plus community members, um, knowing that uh, the targeted programming for them and collecting data on them um, could identify them and out them in communities that could expose them to more harm? And so how do we really navigate this trickiness of, of wanting to collect data and make it useful to inform programming, but also protecting community members? Absolutely. I may not answer all of those in order, uh, but I'm <laughs> happy to respond. Uh, as you probably can guess, I do have um, concerns uh, that we try to make sure that we address. Uh, there have been times where we have said we cannot collect data uh, of a certain type or to respond to certain data requests out of an abundance of caution because of our do no harm approach. Um, there are times where we have been asked to report on, for example, the number of individuals in the LGBTQI plus community that a project is engaging. Um, and because it hasn't been built into the project design or approach, um, we cannot safely do that. Uh, so we will say no. Um, this is this is something that we need to do to protect this community. This is something we need to collect this data safely, which means, as I mentioned before, building it in uh, to our approaches early and making sure that we we have the appropriate methods. So we have been able to collect this data, but this means working with our donor and making sure that we're working with local communities and building in the approaches. So by that, what I mean is in, in our context, this has largely been a challenge because for one thing, this is relatively new for us to start addressing this, but we're also in fields. We're in extension uh, programs, we're in cooperatives, we're in businesses, we're not in clinical settings. So we're engaging with different groups and we're engaging with them in different ways. But we're also needing to start in a different place to some degree with this data collection. This isn't about counting heads. This is about collecting data that helps us understand, again, that context and how the norms are really going to affect our engagement and the program at, programs we should be implementing and how we should be implementing them. So that means collecting this information to that degree and making sure we're collecting the right type of information and not simply identifying people who they are, what their identities are for that purpose. So we need to be thinking about really the context and what the appropriate types of methodologies are. That may not be going directly to individuals. It may actually be thinking about data collection methods in a much more expansive and creative way, which is why those local partnerships are so important. For one thing, across multiple contexts, people don't necessarily use the same terms or same ways to describe these identities. And that is a really important place to start, which is how do you even define these identities? How do you think of these identities? That's not always simple. But then we may need to be speaking to market actors in order to understand what the context is, what the culture is in terms of how they exclude or include uh, individuals 
Um, so simply uh, reaching out to individuals and, and conducting focus groups may not actually be the, the place to start. So there's a number of ways we need to think about collecting data uh, a bit differently, but we also want to make sure we're thinking about the context in order to understand it. Now I do have, um, I could go for a long time about data collection processes, storage, do no harm, but we'll save that for another webinar. Um, but it does mean that we've been able to collect data as part of, for example, formative research, JESI analyses, in order to understand what it is uh, is happening and in working with local partners um, to do that. Sometimes that means um, really uh, understanding things like uh, how is this affecting uh, differently, as I mentioned before, um, transgender individuals and accessing jobs uh, versus uh, lesbian women and, and gay men, but really thinking within that context, not simply uh, what the social norms are, but how is this impacting what we're trying to do as a program and then thinking effectively uh, in the context, what are the things that they need and, and how should that impact our approaches and who we should partner with and how we should engage. Um, so it's a broader question than data, but we really need to think about the approaches and how we collect it and use it. Uh, and that means really understanding the context and the dangers and the risk to partners, because there are contexts in which the organizations we would work with need to do more than just say this is the percentage of population we're working with or the number of people engaged, but to talk about what the challenges are and how we're engaging with this group and helping address the enabling environment and helping uh, to address them to overcome these challenges. So really what type of change are we helping to engage in? Great, thank you, Jen. Um, I know that that was a, a call to action for, for us at USAID and our headquarters to think about uh, SOGIES data and, and our programming. And I know that that is something that we are definitely working on um, and, and more to come over the next year in that space. Um, we are almost at time. And so I just want to say uh, thank you for everyone that's joining us today. I hope that um, what our presenters and experts have shared uh, is really a call to action to all of us uh, to prioritize meaningful partnership with LGBT plus organizations um, and really doing that uh, particularly in the agricultural space uh, and, and economic growth space for these. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to all of our panelists, uh, to USAID Center for Agricultural and to the AgriLinks team, uh, all of you for helping to put this on today and for joining us. Um, it's really great to see participants from all over the world. I was uh, looking at some of the comments, but there were a lot of uh, comments in the chat box, so I couldn't keep up with all, but it looks like there were folks from all over the world that were joining us today. And so really thank you uh, for being a good partner and ally in this space going forward. Um, wanted to share just a couple of key takeaways before we end today. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think everyone spoke to upholding the principles of nothing about us without us and do no harm. Uh, we know that LGBTQI plus people and organizations are really the experts on their realities. And so we need to make sure that we are cultivating really meaningful and deep relationships with these organizations um, so that we can have uh, really mutual partnerships that amplify their wisdom, that brings in their needs and wants and it puts us in a role of supporting their work uh, to the best of our ability. Um, but we also wanna note that, uh, you know, particularly in do no harm, that doesn't mean that we do nothing. Uh, you know, this conversation today has been really important uh, to talk about LGBTQI plus economic empowerment and livelihoods uh, in the agricultural space and how this has been really crucial for individual dignity and societies and ultimately whole economies as we've heard about. Um, and we have heard from really, um, a, really great advocates in this space uh, from the community and knowing that uh, they want us to be doing something um, and we've heard directly from them so let's continue that work you know secondly i want us to uh, you know one of the key takeaways i've heard is that we have to be thinking structurally and holistically about this work uh, this means taking a multidisciplinary systemic and really cross-sectoral approaches to this work and so we all have to be open to new and creative solutions that really combined and expand all of the programmatic tools that we have. You know, just for an example, we had a really excellent conversation today uh, that talked about uh, LGBTQI plus inclusive 
and responsive data collection that is, is a really important part and complementary to the work uh, of uh, expanding agricultural and market systems for LGBT CRI plus folks. Um, and then just finally, uh, we all need to be continuing to learn in this space. Um, I'm really happy with all of the engagements and the conversations that have been happening, uh, both with our panelists, uh, within the chat box, with the questions that we got for everyone. Um, and so I'm really heartened to see that we are all in this learning space and we have to continue to collaborate with each other, with LGBT CRI plus groups and communities, uh, and with all of us at USAID so that we are really working to create and advance environments where all LGBT CRI plus people can thrive. Um, and so with that, I want to say thank you again to all of us, for, uh, everyone for joining us today. And if you would like to continue the conversation, uh, get in contact with us uh, at USAID and our LGBT CRI plus team here in USAID's Inclusive Development Hub. Uh, you can email us at lgbtqi at usaid.gov. Uh, we'll also put it into the chat box, but that's lgbtqi at usaid.gov. And then, of course, you can follow us on Twitter at usaid underscore lgbtqi. And so, again, thank you very much. We hope everyone continues to have a great day and great rest of your week. And really, with much appreciation for joining us at today's webinar, Farming Under the Rainbow. Bye, everyone.